Hey, I found some more. All right. Hi, guys. Pretend that says WordCamp Boston 2014 and change the dates in your notes, please. <laughs> Hi, I, I am uh, Sam Hotchkiss. I'm from uh, Brunswick, Maine. Uh, my company, Parka LLC, is based in Bath, uh, Maine, just a little bit north of Portland. Uh, and we build uh, Brute Protect, which is an awesome security tool. You should try it out. All right, that's me. So, um, we're going to run 10 minutes shorter, and we are going to uh, talk a little bit about APIs. Uh, please forgive me, this is not the talk I thought I was giving today. <laughs> Does oh, oh. Let me get this thing working. There we go. All right. So I, I'd like to start this off with a little bit of a history lesson. And for those of you who are looking for code examples on how you integrate WordPress with external APIs, sorry I didn't prepare that talk. Um, this talk is going to go over what are the implications of APIs. We're going to talk a little bit about the history of, uh, of, of using APIs between websites, and we're going to dig into what can we do with APIs in WordPress in the future. Right? The, you know, there are a lot of talks going around, and a lot of talk happening around uh, the new JSON REST API that's coming into WordPress. It's really awesome, and it's going to open up all of these worlds of possibilities. And you keep hearing that over and over, right? You keep hearing this is going to open up all of these worlds of possibilities. But what are those worlds? And let's start to sort of explore, uh, explore that. So, in the beginning, there was the internet. <laughs> this was the first website. Um, and the idea of creating a website was to create these, these interlinking pages, right? Like books or magazines that you could quickly flip to the right, right page, the right article. You could quickly find the reference material, uh, whatever it is. You know, we have this pattern when we invent new technology of using that new technology to recreate something that we're already familiar with, right? So this was the first website ever in 1992. We see that pattern of recreating things that we're familiar with when we look at the Facebook. And the Facebook was very simply a recreation of Harvard's Facebook, right? The cell phone. The first cell phone did nothing other than allow you to make and receive phone calls. It was very, very similar to, you know, an analog phone at your home. It did one thing, and people weren't quite conceiving of the other ways that we could use this technology. I would be willing to bet that there's no one in this room who uses their cell phone more than 20% for this function, right? So. You know, they, there's always this process where early on we're simply replicating things that exist. And as the internet progressed, we get to the year 2000. And in the year 2000, we saw our first API, which was Salesforce.com. And Salesforce, uh, this little startup at that point in time, realized it might be interesting to take their data and relate it. Uh, they had a number of really uh, exciting features. Uh, like fast access, so it can load quickly on your 28.8 modem, uh, which was pretty useful at the time. But the most important thing out of everything they did was connecting all of your applications via our XML API, because that allowed them to start becoming a tool in a larger environment, right? It allowed them to start integrating with other tools that were out there, with other platforms. It allowed them to import data and export data in ways that were really easy to understand, and that data could be translated across multiple platforms. Not to be outdone, later that year, eBay does the same thing. They come out, uh, they were a very early API, and uh, a couple years later, uh, you get Amazon Web Services. Uh, you know, and at that point, we were building XML SOAP APIs. I'm not sure if anyone in here has ever worked with an XML SOAP API, but it is like pulling your hair out. Um, so we've come a long way. But even at that point in time, APIs were really having sort of a slow, uh, a slow adoption, right? And until we had a couple other players hop on board. Delicious was one of the first, and they allowed you to, uh, very early on, change a variable in your URL 
and have all of the data spit out in machine-readable format. So now you could easily point your web app at the delicious servers, grab the information that you wanted. Um, Facebook was close behind, Flickr was close behind. And one of the big turning points for APIs was actually Google Maps. Because when Google launched Google Maps, everybody wanted it, right? Everyone thought this was the coolest thing ever. And so people were hacking it in wherever they could. They were building iframes and they were, uh, you know, they were trying to figure out ways that they could pull this data into, uh, in, into other uh, platforms. Uh, and so eventually Google would just said, okay, fine, um, we're going to release it as an API, and, uh, and that was that. And then there was mobile. So you have all of these sort of jumps and starts at, uh, at getting API-based technology. And then the iPhone comes out and changes the way that we interact with technology and interact with devices because all of a sudden you have a reason to get your data on something other than a website, right? You have a reason to take your data and push it into a mobile app, push it into a different format so that it's ready to go. Um, so, you know, what is an API? I'm assuming most of you know, uh, since you're here. But, the purpose of an API is to provide machine accessible data without design. How do we separate that data component out from the design and keep those two things independent? Another side of this that's important to think about and understand is semantic data. So semantic data is data that's organized in such a way that it can be interpreted meaningfully without human intervention. So, you know, we can have a machine that will go through and pull out pieces of information and understand what those pieces of information mean. Understand connections between different pieces of data and put that together in a bigger way. So first let's talk a little bit, we're, we're going to talk about two aspects of the API and the implications of both. One is the publicly available API, so data that you're giving away to everybody, and one is the private API where you're using that data in known transactions. Uh, I have a video here. So this is, uh, this is Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of the internet, uh, giving a TED talk a few years ago talking about uh, the importance of this data. Government department, can you find that these people, they're very tempted to keep to, to handle the whole of database hugging. You, you, you hug your database, you don't want to let it go until you've made a beautiful website for it. Well, I'd like to suggest that, well, before you just make a beautiful website, huh, who might say don't make a beautiful website? Make a beautiful website, but first, give us the unadulterated data. We want the data. We want unadulterated data. Okay, we have to ask for raw data now, and I'm going to ask you to practice that, okay? Can you say raw? Raw. Can you say data? Just say now. Raw data now! Raw. Practice that is important because you have no idea the number of excuses people come up with to hang on to their data and not give it to you even though you've paid for it as a taxpayer. And it's not just America, it's all over the world. And it's not just governments, of course it's enterprises as well. So, you know, the, the, most, uh, the most exciting thing about data is that thing that you can't think of, right? Because if you can think of everything that can be done with your data, well, A, A, you can't, and B, you might be able to go out and do it. But it's when you put that data out publicly and other people are able to come get it, uh, that, that it really becomes powerful and it becomes exciting. Uh, and so you might be sitting here saying, you know, this is really great, Sam. Uh, if, if I had a big store of data, I would absolutely do this. Cool, thank you. Uh, but... I'm just a small online store, right? Um, so I, I'm going to ask you, imagine if all of your e-commerce data was standardized. Uh, if all of your meta terms were the same, if, if your post types were named the same as everybody else, you could switch from one e-commerce plugin to another without having to worry about it at all. Just make the switch. You could install add-ons to whatever e-commerce plugin you're running, and all of those add-ons would work from site to site to site, from plugin to plugin, no matter how they're set up. And you could have your products pulled into a no number of other formats. 
So, you know, any mobile device would be with a, you know, shopping app could go to your site and it would pull all of your data into the right format so it's more like browsing Amazon than it is like browsing your site, right? But what if I'm just a blog? What if you could tag everything that you're talking about and all of that data could get pulled into this larger encyclopedia of information? where everything, you know, if, if you think about Wikipedia, right, Wikipedia is this centralized, very curated source. But what if there were also a way to browse about some person or some event or something and immediately get, get every blog article about them? And if, if you could go into, uh, you know, reading about a restaurant, pull in every review that's been written anywhere on the restaurant about them, so on and so forth. If that data was standardized, we could build that. It's really important to understand that the idea of controlling the presentation of your data is dying. There are two very distinct functions when you're talking about the internet, right? We have our data, and we have the presentation of that data. Obviously, there's no, no harm, and it's a good thing to build a beautiful presentation of that data and try and go out and present that data in the best way as, as possible. But, like Tim says, the first thing you need to do is get that data out there. Let others interact with your site, with your content, in the way that they want to. Don't lock them into your experience because you want them to see things in this way. No matter how much you love the layout of your website, and it may be great, and 99% of people out there might really love it, there's going to be 1% of people who would rather see it in this format, that format, or the other. In the near future, interactions with data are going to be automated and not point-to-point -point interactions. So rather than uh, you know, a one-to-one -one relationship where I have my WordPress mobile app and it's talking to my WordPress website, it's going to be uh, sort of a, almost an extension of RSS where you can have multiple sites communicating with multiple other sites and sharing data in ways that, that really create this interconnected web uh, like we have with the internet now. But with our data, not just with links of pages of information, right? Uh, you're not going to... Uh, I even wrote myself an example. <laughs> so, uh, you know, one, one example of this is if you wanted to build the next Etsy, and rather than have all of the makers come to your site and upload their products there, what if you could write a site that's going to go out and it's going to find all of these individual makers and it's going to grab their content and it's going to pull them in so you can browse through on this one centralized location 10,000 different individual makers who are making their own, uh, their own products and we're going to allow you to browse through. Oh, and guess what? Their checkout has an API as well. So you can check out in one place and this site is going to aggregate that, that checkout data to a number of sites, it's going to distribute payments as it's meant to, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, you know, the power of this is, is pretty, uh, pretty exciting. So what needs to happen in order for us to get here? <clears throat> we need to standardize meta. I think this is one of the most important things that's going on in the WordPress community right now is we have plugin to plugin to plugin to plugin doing exactly the same thing using completely different terms to do it. So. You know, if we could get all of the e-commerce plugins on the same page with this is these are the meta terms we're going to use. If we could get all of the SEO plugins on the same page with these are the meta terms we're going to use, so on and so forth, and you're able to use those plugins interchangeably, and we're able to push forward that content in a semantic way where it's readable over the internet, uh, it, it makes it really, really easy. Beyond just standardizing what terms we're going to use, we also need to get into a more standard way with how we're registering that meta, right? We need to go in and register our meta in a way where we're saying this is public or this is private. Uh, we, we need to uh, be a little bit more explicit in what can be done with that metadata. Secondly, we need to use our metadata, right? So, uh, you know, if you have a block of content, that's great, but if you can pull out a few of the points and, uh, and separate that out 
as meta where it can be uh, searched and cataloged. Uh, it's going to, uh, again, help bring that data out into, uh, into a larger universe, a larger sphere. Uh, you know, what is this article about? Is it about a restaurant? Okay, what's the name of the restaurant? Uh, and one to five, how do you rate that restaurant? If you could just grab those two pieces of data out of a blog post and have it crawlable, uh, that would go a long way. Okay, so that's us talking about public APIs. Let's talk about the other equally powerful side of APIs, which are private APIs. And really, if we look at the power of authentication, so these green items, these are the truly public things. Post comment may be, it may not be. But once you've authenticated in your API, all of this other content becomes available, which is, uh, is pretty exciting. We have all of these new ways that we can interact with our content, but so what, right? What does this mean for me? Uh, one, completely JavaScript web apps. Uh, so, for example, Rocco over there on our team is working on a completely JavaScript web app called Campomatic for WordCamps, where everyone in this room could go to the same, same site and log in. It would know who you are because your email address is on file as an attendee. So it would say, okay, you're able to come in. And now you're able to either have a discussion with other people in the room, or you can post a question there. Other people in the room can vote whether that's a good question or one that they don't really care about. Uh, or, or rather, they would vote if it's a good question or an inappropriate question, because there are no bad questions, just inappropriate <laughs> questions. Uh, and at the end of my talk, I could pull that page up, and we could have this live, interactive display of uh, all of the questions that people want answers to, right? Native mobile apps. Um, obviously, we're seeing this already, but imagine uh, you know it becoming really, really easy for you to uh, get your content out of your site into a native mobile app. Um, you know, it's it's going to make it easier and easier for that to happen. Same with desktop apps. You know, you can take that same code from your mobile app, port it over into a desktop version, and all of a sudden, your content is now available cross-platform and much more. So. Imagine if you're an antique store. I, I really like to illustrate this using some examples because it starts to get people thinking about the ways that they could apply this to their site. So imagine you're an antique store and you have 10,000 one-off products. And you have a, a local inventory in your point of sale system, but imagine that that could always be kept completely in sync with your website. So everything in your antique store could also be listed on your website, and as soon as someone buys it online, it's going to take it out of your point of sale system in store so you know not to sell it. And if someone buys it in store, it immediately becomes unavailable on your website. That becomes very easy using the, uh, using the API. Imagine that you're a preschool. Right? One, of our, uh, one of our clients is the International Preschools of New York, who we worked with for a few years, and they have very particular concerns about how their data is used. But they also want that data shared out to parents as much as possible and as quickly as possible. So imagine that you could log in and uh, post a, an urgent notice and it would get pushed out to all of the parents' phones um, immediately saying, it's a snow day, you need to come pick up your kids from school. Alternately, when a teacher goes in and publishes photos of a class, those photos could get pushed to the parents' phones. They can go in, they have a, uh, a My Kids Photos app where they can just flip through all of the uh, all of the pictures of their kid from class that week. Uh, same thing pushing to their computer, right? It's all integrating into uh, into their computer. They can pull it up. Maybe they have a custom screensaver so that their screensaver is always the latest pictures of their kids from class. Uh, all of that becomes possible. Imagine a word camp. I already told you about uh, about campomatics, so watch for that someday soon. Right back up? Someday soon. Someday soon. Okay. <laughs> Imagine you're an enterprise, okay, where the entire front end of your site is built outside of WordPress, but you're still pulling your data in from that WordPress back end because that's a really easy way to create and manage content. 
this is my favorite example. My, my, first, uh, my first job where I got to really think creatively and solve problems uh, was at Rocky Mountain Chocolate Factory in Durango, Colorado. I was working at the corporate headquarters in the factory where we would make six million pounds of chocolate every year. Um, I used to be skinny, just as a side note. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I was brought in and all of these uh, lines of machinery were built in the 1950s. And, uh, you know, they made really good chocolate, but um, they would break down. Uh, quite a bit. We had a lot of downtime. And they didn't have any way of really quantifying that. So, you know, I, I figured, okay, I'm going to come solve the problem. And uh, the Arduino had just come out. And so I used an Arduino to interface with the power supply on these 1950s machines so it would detect when, the, when someone had stopped the feed belt. Because if the feed belt stopped, we're not making chocolate anymore. And tied that into a uh, uh, a touch screen, so whenever the uh, whenever the belt stopped, before they would do anything else, it would pop up with six options for why they stopped the belt, and they would hit it, and it would log it into a database. And that was all well and good, you know. We would we would log it in, and then I would a couple times a week go in and uh, uh, go in. Uh, what's the Microsoft database? Access. access, yes. I would go into Access and run reports all day long, trying to pull out. You know, what, what are the bigger lessons here? Um, and, but imagine now, when they hit that, uh, that reason that the line went down, it's now interacting with a WordPress API. So we have, it, it's creating a post every time a machine stops with a reason for why that machine stopped. So essentially we have a P2-like blog that's popping up, uh, you know, this line stopped because of, this line stopped because of, uh, and so management or anyone else in the company can immediately go into one website, see what lines are running, what lines are stopped, why they're stopped. Oh, and we're also able to take all of that data, pull it out, and use a nice JavaScript library to illustrate reasons for downtime and run our, uh, our equations on it to, to really quantify how many dollars uh, this is costing us and uh, you know, move it into uh, purchasing decisions. I'm trying to remember what I meant by this slide. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 imagine plugins. <laughs> oh yes, I do remember now. Okay, right. So, <laughs> so the cool thing with plugins, right, would be this idea of plugins that are not hosted on your site, right? You have remotely hosted plugins that interact with your content via the API. So this means a, you're not executing code on your server. B, these plugins are not restricted to just running on WordPress.org sites. Because WordPress.com sites also have this, this JSON REST API. Now these third-party content plugins can interact with your content that way as well. Uh, so there, I, I, I think we have a coming sort of second boom in product creation for WordPress, which is uh, plugins and tools that interact with your content remotely. Uh, you know, aggregate that data out however, however, however you want to do with it. The, the exciting thing about this, again, is the most exciting parts of how we would use this and how we could interact with this, I can't even begin to think of. So that's your job. Uh, is that like Google Fonts? Like Google Fonts? What is that? No, what, what I'm talking about is more the idea of, you know, imagine you have a, a, a service that's hosted remotely and it's able to access your content remotely so it can pull, uh, say, your blog post and either manipulate it or aggregate it out, uh, but from a, a third party standpoint, and it's able to pull in all of your meta and use that in different ways. Um, so it's, it's using your content from a third party, or it's updating your content, um, right? It, it could be a hosted tool that then interacts with a mobile app or, uh, you know, one of, one of a dozen of other, other things. You know, we get integrations with things like uh, uh, if this or that, or if this then that, um, where you can set up this chain of reactions that happens based on your data. Um, you know, if you have a third party tool that's monitoring for if you receive a new uh, comment, 
on your blog, for example. Let's say you have a uh, Wi-Fi connected light bulb in your, uh, in your office. Whenever you get a new comment, your light bulb blinks red three times, right? Um, you know, obviously that's a silly example, but... <laughs> But, you know, when, once you make that content accessible uh, remotely and easily parsable, uh, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the possibilities at the end of the day are, are pretty exciting. Um, so, last thing, imagine a fully local online, offline WordPress app. Uh, so, uh, who in here use, uses or used Mars Edit? Right? Oh, okay. I can't believe it. I got more hands in the world. Uh, and... Do any of you continue to use Mars Edit? It's kind of fallen behind the times, but the idea of being able to create and get your content ready and, and have full control over your blog, whether or not you're connected to the internet, is a pretty cool one. I mean, you know, I spend a lot of time on airplanes, and um, I know some other airlines have Wi-Fi everywhere uh, on their flights. United, not so good. Uh, so. You know, I would love to be able to manage all of my blog content uh, without being uh, without being online. So, you know, the the biggest uh, the biggest question out of all of this is, what are you going to build? Um, and with that, I would take any questions. And uh, more importantly, I will hear what you have to build. Um, the question was, is there a standard that's emerging now for standardizing the data? Uh, probably the one with the most traction at this point is schema.org. Uh, schema.org has a, uh, a sort of full layout of different terms that we use for uh, different items. Uh, it has full buy-in from Google and Microsoft um, and I think Yahoo. Uh, the, really the idea of this standardized schema has been being pushed hard in the search engine world, right? Uh, because Google wants to fully understand what you're putting up there. They want to be able to put that up, you know, at the top of the page where you search for, uh, you know, uh, Thai Palace hours, and it pops up and says, Thai Palace is closing in 42 minutes. Uh, so they want to be able to understand your data like that. But we want to make sure that that data is put out in a way where not only Google can understand it, right? We want it to be open to everyone uh, because who knows when Google is going to decide that don't be evil is not really their thing anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So uh, we're here because we've been doing iOS mobile apps for travel, geocoded stuff. Cool. We have a database out in the web of about 3,000 listings. Good. Okay. Now we want to do have to think of ourselves as a publisher of this content and yep. do a website based upon WordPress using Templatics directory template. And we're just starting. Okay. So we're here. Any thoughts, guidance? So we your, have, your data is out right now. We have our own web API. Okay. We previously have put a portion of our content out to our supporting website. Right. So, you know, you probably want to not repeat your data, right? You know, you want to use you want to use WordPress to access your other right. API to pull all of that data in. Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that seems like a good way to go about it. For me, I, I, I guess I'm not. And with a plugin with the new WP API. Well, so the the WP JSON REST API is for incoming calls to WordPress, okay. right? If you're going to write outgoing calls, you're probably going to need to write your own plugin. Uh, okay. to manage that data yeah. uh, and, and get it in the format you need it. Um, yeah. I would also recommend if, if your pages are going to be really heavily loaded uh, using that API, try and get your, uh, your WordPress server in the same data center at least so you don't have these big latencies going back and forth to that API if you have to make 20 API calls on every page load. Yeah. You talked a little bit about authentication for being able to do updates. 
Yes. Is there a standard emerging for that? Yeah, so uh, the, the question was, is there a standard emerging for authenticating for updates? And if you look with the JSON REST API, uh, authentication has been handled in a few different ways. Uh, right now, all of the authentication methods are essentially plugins to the API plugin. Um, in production, you almost certainly want to use OAuth. Uh, in testing, you can use a simple username and password authentication. Obviously, don't um, don't keep using that in production. But uh, yeah, there there is an OAuth uh, plugin to the JSON REST API plugin uh, that will allow you to do that. All right, anybody else? Oh, I made it through with five minutes to spare. Oh, wait, one more question. Have people given themselves that um, if you're, putting your, you're, you're freeing your data, um, but you're not putting your data but you have some monetary monetization attached, like say, ads. Okay. And if you're, I mean, I'm just curious what sort of, I think the best in concrete examples, but if you're putting your data out there and someone says, oh, look, here's your next metadata, because yeah, I'll strip that out because I don't yeah. want that. Yeah. So that's, that's, Obviously, one of the biggest challenges that people are having, and one, sorry, I, I need to repeat the question. Okay. Uh, how are people monetizing their data when they get it out through uh, an API? And how do you, if, if your monetization model is advertising, uh, how do you continue to monetize? Um, I don't have a silver bullet, uh, but that said, you know, that's that's one of the biggest pushbacks that people have is, uh, you know, you see it with RSS feeds too. People only want to put the first paragraph of their article in an RSS feed to get you to click on it, and it's so frustrating. I love it when I can go pull an RSS feed and right there in my reader I can get the whole article, but it seems like that's less often than not. Um, but that said, as we move forward, there's going to be uh, a pushback against um, people who are trying to control that data. And so I, I think that if your model is to monetize using display ads, this is a good time to start thinking about how you can change that model. Um, you know, what, what can you do to allow your content to be free but still, uh, you know, making money? Because obviously it is important to make money. Uh, if you can't make money, you probably can't afford to produce content. Um, obviously that's a big question. Uh, and one that I don't have the answer to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you know, you product placement um, is is certainly one way to go about it. Reviews for money, um, as long as you're disclosing that that's what you're doing. Um, you know, uh, sponsored posts, all of that sort of thing. You see more and more lately, which is a way to monetize. I'm not sure if it's the right way, but it is a way to monetize without. Um, holding on to your data so tightly that your knuckles turn away. All right, anybody else? Okay, um, you went up first. When you said um, part of the API is, is having WordPress output raw data for other applications to access, right. is that, do you know if that's being built into WordPress core or is that only a plugin? So right now it only exists as a plugin. Um, it will be integrated into core 4.1 or 4.2. Um, there are a couple people in this room who could better answer that question than I could. But uh, I, I think, is the target still 4-1? Uh, probably 4-2. 4-2. Um, that said, you can run it as a plugin right now. Um, it, you will always be able to either opt out or opt in. Uh, it hasn't been decided whether it will be on by default or off by default. Um, so, uh, but. On by default? Okay. Mason says it'll be on by default, so it'll be on by default. <laughs> um, but you will be able to opt out of sharing your content that way if that's something you're not comfortable with. Yeah? More of a technical thing. Sure. Um, the API seems to be you're pulling data. Are you working on a simple pub sub hub where you can just push your data off so you don't have you know, thousands of sites? I, you know, I, I don't know of anyone working on anything like that. Um, you know, I, I think that part of what we're going to need to look at sort of in a, in a longer time horizon is 
how do we enforce and control caching so that we make sure that we're not just being pummeled by requests that sites that are asking us for data are caching that data and being respectful. Um, that's probably something that will be available as a plugin to the API before too long to uh, sort of throttle uh, incoming requests. Uh, but it, as far as a centralized repository where you're pushing your data to, I'm not aware of anything. Uh, if anybody knows of anything. Okay. I'm not aware, and these guys aren't aware of anything. Either. <laughs> All right? Yeah? Uh, just a quick note, I uh, just recently downloaded an app the Mac called Logo 2, which I believe is kind of competing with Mars. Yeah, I, you know, I saw an ad for that right. in the App Store this weekend. And it, it looks interesting. Yeah. It, it's offering kind of an updated version of I believe what Mars ever did. So. Yeah, so that's, on, that's Blogo 2. Yeah. B-L-O-G-O 2. Okay. Worth checking out. Yeah. Uh, and it, it allows offline yeah. and all of that. Cool. All right. Anything else? All right. Thank you, guys. So if you're interested in WordPress multi-site,